Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Community Church at Cedar Springs New Believers Sunday School class. We're glad to have you this morning. As we get started this this morning, uh, I'm a little bit uh, slow on the go, so uh, it's a great day to sleep in a little bit. It was nice and cool outside last night. I uh, hope everyone had a had a good night's rest and uh, are, are ready to get started this morning and uh, enjoy the day that God has made. But uh, we're going to wait here just for a few minutes as uh, people wake up and get logged on. Uh, just uh, a, a few reminders that uh, of what's coming up uh, at church. Uh, November 1st will be our homecoming. Uh, with a meal afterwards if you would like to come out and, and join us uh, for that in-house that'll be of, of course November 1st uh, at Community Church at Cedar Springs address is 8825 Brownsville Road in Brownsville Kentucky uh, so we'd love to have you come and, and join us for that morning uh, to do that uh, we are still uh, as far as I know, we're, we're still kind of up in the air on what we're doing for uh, Halloween. Uh, I think uh, our county has decided to uh, allow trick-or-treating to, to go on, so I think we may uh, be doing a, a trunk-or-treat. I don't know the times yet on, on when we'll be doing that, but as soon as I find out, I will uh, let you know on here as well. Uh, today, we are in our last lesson in this particular cycle. Uh, this is lesson 26, uh, the consummation. And when we talk about the consummation, we're talking about the definition of consummation. Uh, a lot of times has to do with the, uh, this in marriage and the uh, sealing of that marriage. Uh, but in this particular sense, uh, we can talk about the marriage as Jesus comes back. Uh, but it's the uh, also known as the point at which something is complete. And so we're, we're looking at the, the end times today. Uh, we're looking at uh, the promise that, that God has for us and the, the culmination of all of that coming together. Uh, we are going to be in a couple of different places today. We'll be in First and Second Thessalonians and also Revelations. Uh, if you're interested in this class, uh, we will, and we're not done, I'll be back, uh, I'm going to skip next week and then take a little break uh, to do some extra preparation, but November 1st, uh, we will start over in the Old Testament. Uh, so we will start at Lesson 1 and work our way back through Lesson 26. Uh, if you're looking at this video for the first time and not familiar with our curriculum, uh, this class is uh, intended for believers who have come to uh, to Christ and uh, a later time in their lives, and they uh, may not have grown up in church. They may not have understood the Bible or never opened a Bible before. And so this is kind of a bird's eye view of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation uh, in the course of six months. It's a 26-lesson class. Uh, and we just kind of hit the uh, high points as we go along. Uh, some areas, depending on our, our who our students are and what interests they have, uh, try to tailor this to, to the students. It's a little bit uh, more difficult doing it on social media uh, since I don't have the, the uh, instant uh, response back or questions back that we do that. Uh, but I, I try to cover the points that, that our students are most interested in as we go through that. But as we uh, continue on today, uh, let us open up with a word of prayer before we get into scripture and we will continue from there. So if you would, please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we just thank you for all the blessings that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to uh, meet together in this uh, place at this time Lord, through social media. And Lord, I pray that anyone that's watching this, wherever they are, Lord, that uh, your spirit will be upon them, uh, that you will bless them, and uh, they will uh, be changed by something in this lesson today in a way that will cause them to seek you out more. 
Lord, we just uh, thank you for all the work that you've done in our lives. We thank you for the promise of the future that we're going to talk about today. Lord, we just uh, are sitting here. We are wanting to do your work. We're waiting for your, uh, your son's return. And Lord, we just ask for, for patience. We ask for peace. We ask for comfort in this uh, distressful time. Lord, we pray for our leaders uh, at all levels, Lord, that they will uh, look to you and to seek wisdom, uh, that they will make decisions uh, that will glorify you. And Lord, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so let's uh, get started. We're going to open up in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to read both the uh, Thessalonian verses first, and then we'll talk about those. So 1 Thessalonians 1, uh, we will start at verse 8. And it says, For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. And now if we'll skip over to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2. And we're going to read uh, verses 1 through 4. And it says, Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us, to the elect that day, oh, to the elect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so called God or object to worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Okay, let's, uh, let's look at a, a couple of things here that, that Paul's writing about to, to the people of Thessalonica at this particular point in his, uh, his ministry. Uh, he's looking at a church, or, or a church that was established uh, that had been idol worshipers at, at this particular point. Uh, and as Paul is, is talking about this, um, their repentance and their turning away from the idols and serving God uh, had gone out and reached other communities uh, around them as something uh, extraordinary uh, that has happened uh, in them. And, uh, you know, we, we see that a lot of times some of the, I know when I was in, uh, I think, high school or college, there was a, a, a gentleman who had made rounds across the country and He'd come to one of our local churches to speak, and he had been an enforcer in the Hell's Angels. And uh, he was covered in tattoos, which at that time uh, was something absolutely uh, out of the ordinary. Tattoos weren't uh, part of the culture at, at that time in, in life, uh, 100 years ago or whenever. Uh, but so he was covered head to toe in tattoos. He was a rough looking guy. Uh, he had lived a rough life. He, he shared some of that in his testimony, but he had uh, surrendered to God and changed his life, repented, turned around, and was working a, as a minister a, as he traveled the country sharing the gospel with people. And there were so many people that were amazed at his transformation uh, from uh, the life that he once lived to the life that he was living under under Jesus. And a lot of people, even though the gospel had been spoken, had been preached in the, in the area by pastors and, and uh, preachers and uh, elders for years and years and years, the impact this man had because uh, of his transformation uh, had a powerful uh, spirit or... or powerful message behind it that that caused people uh to 
seek God out. And so we're uh, a lot of times when we know uh, somebody that that has been against God in our in our neighborhood, possibly in our families, uh, possibly ourselves, uh, and the way that we lived our lives and, and uh, ungodliness, and then suddenly we are changed and uh, things happen. Uh, we have a more powerful uh, testimony because uh, people know that the change that we have gone through was nothing that we did on our own, uh, but it had to be uh, a supernatural spirit or power that affected the change in us to make us a, almost a, a different person. And we've talked about this for the last several weeks and how when we are saved, we are made a new creation. And the old person in ourselves is dead and cast away uh, when we receive Jesus Christ. We look the same on the outside, but our actions, our, our uh, sensibilities, our, our compassion, our grace, and our mercy have changed uh, in that, in that uh, transformation. And so that's what Paul, Paul is commending uh, this particular church for uh, the actions that they had the, of changing from worshiping idols to uh, following God in that sense. And the first question that we have today, it says that how does knowing the end of the Bible give us hope and confidence today? And, and again, we, we talked about this. We've talked about this uh, in our Bible study on Wednesday nights and, and Sunday and the other Sunday school class on Sunday nights that we do, uh, as well as uh, we talked about trials and tribulations. Uh, last week, we talked about perseverance. And, and part of uh, the understanding of, of perseverance that we had that we discussed last week was the fact of knowing and trusting God uh, is working in our lives for good. Even though there are bad things happening around us, even though there are things that we're having to go through at a particular time in our life that we're not enjoying, whether it's illness, uh, pain, or, or uh, an illness, uh, could be a death in the family, could be a loss of uh, work, uh, it could be uh, any, any number of things that, that causes us distress. Uh, that causes us uh, discomfort and, and causes us doubt. And when I say doubt, I'm talking about uh, there are times when our faith is, is tested, uh, is, is what we believe as Christians are really true. Are we really? Uh, good morning, Barbara. Glad to see you this morning. Uh, but are our beliefs true is there really a god uh does he still work in my life is he still actively uh seeking uh to uh take care of me uh in in whatever situation that i'm going through and, and we as humans we have those doubts uh the thing is is that is where our church family comes into play and the importance of being plugged in and, and being an active member of an actual church, not just sitting at home watching uh, YouTube videos or Facebook, Facebook videos or television programs or whatever. You can get some really good uh, preaching on television. You can get some really good messages. But it's the, the opportunity of being part of a community uh, that is so important uh, that we're called to uh, as being the reason that you need to be connected to an actual church. So that times when you are going through trials, when you're going through hardships, uh, you have a support system of believing brothers and sisters that will rally around you, encourage you, lift you up, and help you through uh, those times until God completes the work uh, that he has in that season of your life. Uh, you just can't get that uh, sitting at home by yourself. Uh, it, it takes a it takes a community 
uh, to work with each other. And, and Scripture knows that, and it, it encourages us uh, to uh, commune together, to be together uh, at, as much as possible in those times. But knowing that God has a purpose for us, has a reward for us, has something better for us down the road, helps us to see past uh, whatever current trouble or, or trial that we're going through. Uh, that's something that, that people who don't have God uh, are missing out on. And I remember those days. Uh, when I was uh, away from the church and away from God and uh, trying to figure out when something disastrous happened in my life, uh, how am I going to get through this? Uh, how am I going to fix this? How am I going to be able to get done with this? And, and so, again, it was all focused on me and, and my limited abilities, even though I, I thought I could do a whole lot. Uh, when it came right down to it, there wasn't a whole lot that I that I could do, uh, and there was absolutely nothing nothing I could do to to change the course of things that happened in life. I had no uh, no power over tornadoes or storms or death or accidents or the what other people did. Uh, I could react on myself and, and try to recover or or uh, skirt those dangers uh possibly but again my my resources and my uh abilities were limited because i'm i'm just human uh i make mistakes and uh, i don't know everything i don't know the the correct course of action uh most of the time so uh we have to rely on god and his promises to be able to get get us through those times and it says, what are some ways that we can shift our focus from the temporary to the permanent? And again, that's, that's what we were talking about, that we, we have to understand that things that happen in our life that are, that are good or bad uh, are temporary. And while we're here on earth, everything is temporary. Uh, not just the, the physical uh, things that we can collect, which we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but uh, every... Feelings, emotions, uh, illness, uh, all those things are temporary uh, that we have to go through. And the trick is, is like I said, looking past those and looking to the, the permanent reward that God is giving us. And the way that we do that, we just talked about that. One of the ways that we do that is be active in, in your community, in your community of uh, brothers and sisters at your church uh, share your problems share your victories uh, that's one thing I, I, I like to stress with people in our congregation uh, sometimes going to church is just oh man it's bad news after bad news after bad news we ask for prayer requests and it's just uh, everybody is having something going on in their life that they need prayer over it's it's terrible uh, it's bad news, it's bad news, it's bad news. And when we ask for praise reports, it's, uh, you can hear crickets in the building. Uh, we, we have a tendency as humans to remember the bad things in our life, but very rarely do we remember the good things that, that uh, happen in our life. Uh, we have blessings that, that we are uh, subject to every single day that we overlook and usually take for granted. Uh, some people have a, have a little bit better perspective than others, uh, especially if you've had a loved one that, uh, that almost died and, and uh, through God's grace, uh, kept them here uh, for whatever purpose, for whatever reason, for whatever work, uh, remembering that you almost lost that person, whether it's a spouse or uh, a mother or a child. Uh, and every day that you see them, you're reminded that there was a time when they, uh, they very likely wouldn't have been here. And so in those instances, I think we're, we're more apt to be thankful for that. But are, are we thankful that, that God woke us up in the morning? Are, are we thankful that uh, our car starts in the morning? Are we thankful that we, uh, that we have a job? 
Are we thankful that we were able to get to that job in the morning? Uh, were we thankful that we were able to uh, clock out of that job at the end of the day? Are we uh, thankful that, uh, that we've got clothes to wear? Are we thankful that we have clean water to drink? Are, are we thankful that we have uh, uh, electricity that's, uh, that uh, is reliable? Uh, and all these things that we kind of take for granted because uh, they've been around for so long, we have to remember that uh, at one point those things didn't exist. And uh, in a blink of an eye, they could not exist again. Uh, we, we've seen some of that in, in uh, this particular pandemic and people going to the groceries. Uh, people ha have always thought, well, the groceries always have everything that I need. Uh, if I ever run out, I can go to the grocery and get whatever I want to eat. And then we saw that groceries were uh, low on stock and they were running out of food and running out of products. And people began to panic because they realized uh, that uh, without the grocery stores, uh, they were kind of in a situation uh, of hopelessness. Uh, and, and so we have to look past uh, whatever's going on temporarily in our lives and look to the end of that. Uh, reading the Bible is an absolute must. Uh, on a daily basis, you should be reading uh, reading your Bible. doesn't mean you need to read a, an entire book every day, uh, but have some scripture, uh, either through a devotional, uh, through a reading plan, uh, or, or anything, any reason to open your Bible and read, read some scripture uh, so that you can be enlightened and, and have a connection with God uh, for that day through his word. The second question that we have on this, it says, in what ways does Satan tempt us to long for idols rather than God for fulfillment? And I, I mentioned this uh, a couple of times or several times throughout the, the course of this study uh, that I believe that the, our Western civilization has created a, a bubble around itself of convenience and of, of uh, science that it doesn't allow God to work. And, and I go back to that in, in understanding a, a story of a, a friend of mine who was a missionary who went to, uh, 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 I don't know the area, it was an area in Africa that was very, very poor. Uh, they went to uh, build to help build a church and this entire village uh, basically lived underneath a one single tree uh, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, uh, they had to walk almost three or four miles to get water. And the water was muddy and dirty. Uh, but they had to do that every day. And there were women and children that were tasked to do that. Uh, the men would hunt. And uh, most of the times they, they wouldn't find any anything uh to eat and the, the building materials that they had to build this church out of uh, would, it was like somebody, or, or the description that he told me was like somebody had gone to a garbage dump and just pulled uh, scraps of material uh, out of the dump and just piled it up and expected them to try to build a church, which they, they brought some of their own materials and they managed to get this one building done and, and as they were leaving, uh, the entire village began to cry and weep. And not just, you know, uh, tears of longing, but actual loud weeping, gnashing of teeth and that kind of thing. And the leader of the group asked uh, their interpreter what, what was wrong or what, what the problem was. And he had told, he told the, the group that they were crying uh, and they were praying for the group that was leaving because they were going back to a place uh, where God was second uh, because of all of the conveniences they had. And he said it struck him to the core to realize that uh, these people, the, they knew every single day that if they went to bed and their child was still alive at the end of the day, it was because God was there. If they found, if they had water to drink, it was because God had given it to them. If they had food to eat, it was because God had provided it for them. Uh, if, if they made it a day without some type of disease or ailment, 
It was because God had protected them. So everything in their, every minute detail of their life was dependent on God's provision. And they realized that. And they also realized that the people that had come to help them were going back to a place where God wasn't needed. Uh, if they wanted clean water, they tur we turn on the faucet. If we are hot, we turn on the air conditioner. If we're cold, we turn on our heaters. Uh, we have houses that we live in that don't leak, uh, that protect us from the elements. We have uh, food that, that, are, that is at our disposal all the time, or most of the time. Uh, even though the, the grocery sales at some point this year may have been bare on something, there was still food there. It was just stuff nobody wanted to eat. Uh, but the food was available. We're, we're kind of picky in our food. We, we've gotten to the point where uh, we want to eat what tastes good, not what is going to keep us alive. And that's kind of evident, too, is if you look at me, uh, uh, years of donuts and bacon have uh, been hard on my body, but I, I sure like donuts and bacon. Uh, but it, it's an idea that we have created a, an environment for ourselves where we don't have to rely on God for the little things, or we don't think we have to rely on God. Let me change that. We don't think we have to rely on God for the little things when we take those things for granted. And so the many times, the only time we turn to God is when we are put in a position where there is no hope outside of God. So we have people who contract horrible diseases, uh, heart attacks, cancer, uh, uh, different ailments or whatever else that doctors don't have any control over either. Uh, there are some treatments they can do, but they're not, they're not always successful. And in those times, we have to rely on God. I know uh, a lot of people who have been healed from cancer, not from doctors, uh, but from, from prayers and from, from God's influence and, and uh, mercy and grace in their life. Uh, and so we, we live in a culture that, that it's very easy for us to worship idols. Now, we're not, I'm not talking about having little statues that all around our house that we stop and pray and offer sacrifices to and those kind of things. But and when we're talking about idols, we're talking about anything uh, that comes before the Almighty God. Uh, and, and those things uh, a lot of times could be uh, money. It could be power. It could be status. It could be our spouse. It could be our children. Uh, it, it could be... Uh, it could be any number of things. It could be our cars, our houses, uh, th those kind of things. Anything uh, that takes precedence over worshiping God is an idol. Now, you may not like the, the sound of that. That may sound ridiculous to you, uh, but that's the truth of it, uh, that God wants to be first in our lives above everything and everyone else. Uh, you need to love God more uh, than you love your spouse. And I know for a lot of people that, that is a hard uh, hard pill to swallow. Uh, I, I still remember that uh, my wife struggled with that when we first got married. And actually the, when someone uh, had mentioned that to her, she was offended and, and mad for a long time. But she, uh, we both uh, weren't very good at at uh, expressing ourselves and, and our relationship with God wasn't very good at that time in our lives, but uh, we both had an encounter with Jesus Christ about the same time uh, that changed changed us uh, for the better. And now she wholeheartedly uh, admits that she loves God and Jesus more than she loves me, and she loves me a whole lot. I know she does, uh, but but God and God is number one in her life. And she dictates her actions based on her relationship with God over her relationship with me. And that's the way that it should be. Second part of this question says, what is the connection from turning from idols and waiting for Jesus in return? And that's one of the things Paul was talking about here, that uh, one of the things he commended the, the church was that they had turned from idols and they're waiting for the second coming of Christ. They're waiting for Christ to come back. And again, the, the connection is if we, if we put God first in our lives, if we turn away from all the idols in our life and God becomes first, 
we are seeking him out. We want uh, to be in his presence. And, and so when we, when we are focused in that way, uh, the things around us that are going on really don't seem to matter as much when we have our focus completely on him and we're waiting for him to come back. Question three says, and what are some ways in which people in our culture actively oppose God? Now, that's we could be here all day listening uh, to the way that our culture uh, opposes God. Uh, so I, that's kind of a subject. It's not a subjective question, uh, but I, I'm going to leave those ideas to you. Uh, as far as the things that uh, you can turn on the the thing that comes to mind right now the the biggest thing that stands out to me in the way that our culture opposes God is the anger and the separation of people based on skin color political views and ideals uh, we are all created in the image of God uh, we all have the same uh, inherent value to God, uh, regardless of what our political views are, what our skin color is, or what our uh, ideals, uh, worldview is. We are all his creation, and we are called to love each other regardless of anything else. And so uh, the lack of love for each other, I think, is the biggest thing that we're dealing with right now that shows that our culture is actively opposed to God. If you have, if you follow God, if you follow Jesus, if you have the Holy Spirit living within you, you have to love people. Uh, there, there's no uh, conditions in that. There's no uh, ifs, ands, or buts in that. If you are following the Holy Spirit, you have to love others the way that God loves them. Now, is that easy? Absolutely not. Uh, and again, that's another reason why we need God in our life. We need God's presence to be able to overcome uh, our, our cultural boundaries in that way to love unconditionally other people. We can only love that way if we love God. Uh, we have to have a power source to be able to, to produce that over. It says, what are the, what are, the second part of that question is, what are some common things we could expect people to do that follow the ways of the world? And, and I mentioned those earlier in the way that we've set up idols for ourselves. Uh, we rely on science. We rely on the, the processes and the, uh, the things that we have put together for ourselves. Uh, again, if we want clean water, we get it from the faucet. We have uh, places to get food. Uh, we can even have it prepared and, and handed to us without ever getting out of our vehicles in, in about two minutes. Uh, we get mad if it takes two minutes. If we have to wait in line for two minutes to get an entire meal for our family, we get mad because they took too long. Uh, but it, but it's there. If we get sick, we go to a doctor. If they can't figure it out, we go to another doctor. Uh, so we have put processes in place uh, around us to put our faith in. We have more faith in, in the electric company than we have faith in, in Jesus Christ. And, and that may sound odd, but it, we do. Uh, every single morning, when you hit that light switch, there is, you are faithful, or there is faith that that light is going to come on. And, and when, the, the, when the power goes out, for whatever reason, it's almost a time to panic. Uh, but but even so, when the power goes out, we have faith that it'll be back on uh, shortly. Uh, I, I still remember the ice storm of 93 when it came through, and we didn't have power for three weeks, and people about lost their minds because, uh, one, it was cold as all get out, and, and two, they didn't have televisions or anything to occupy their time with. Can you imagine if that happened today, uh, that uh, if electricity went completely out uh, your cell phones would eventually go dead your uh, of course uh, your computers wouldn't work uh, there wouldn't be not only would there not be any TV there wouldn't be any internet there wouldn't be uh, you wouldn't have uh, most people don't have a landline telephone in their house anymore uh, so they rely on those cell phones to uh, 
to keep them in touch and when they run out of energy and run out of power and you don't have any way to charge them back up, man, it would be, it, it would be beyond chaos. Uh, and, and so people take measures to make sure they're not in that by having uh, battery backups or generators or whatever else in their houses so they don't do that. But man, mention the second coming of Christ, that Christ is coming back at one day. And, and this is what this is what uh, amazes me is that people will take precautions for things that may happen. Uh, there's a, we have drawers with batteries in it. If the power goes out, we've got batteries to power flashlights. Uh, we got, pa we got batteries, uh, to, to power our cell phones up if we need to or, or whatnot in that kind of way. And, and so we make preparations for that, but we know as Christians, and the Bible tells us, Jesus Christ is coming back. Everyone will be uh, subjected to judgment. Now, those who are in the Lamb's Book of Life will have the penalty of that judgment passed over them. But it's my belief, and again, this is my personal opinion, and I know there are a lot of people that will disagree with, with me on that, is the fact that we will still stand before God in judgment, that everyone will, Christians and non-Christians alike. And when it comes to that point, the, and again, that only makes sense to me because if I'm standing before God and I am judged and I know what the penalty for that judgment is and, and I have no recourse or excuse for the judgment that is brought against me in that heavenly court, that I am hopeless without Jesus Christ. But I have Jesus Christ. And it's the fact right before judgment is passed, I, 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 Jesus Christ will come and say, no, he's mine. Nick is mine. He's one of mine. Uh, I'm going to take him. And it's the knowledge of having Jesus Christ pay the penalty or pass over the penalty that will allow me to rejoice for eternity. Standing at the standing at the precipice of hell, knowing that I deserve to be in hell, but then being rescued by Jesus Christ will allow me uh, the gratitude to be able to praise and worship God for all eternity. Now that's what makes sense to me. And again, like I said, there there are other uh, people and, and Bible scholars, I'm sure that that have a different view of that, but. For me, I believe that everyone will stand before God in judgment. And it's, and it's just before punishment is exacted that Jesus Christ will say, no, he is in the Lamb's book of life. He is in my book of life. Uh, he is mine or she is mine. And, and I am taking her uh, to be with me. We know that's going to happen. And, and yet so many people will not make preparations for that day. They refuse. Oh, I've got, I've got time. I'm only 16. Uh, that's just for old people. Or, I, or uh, you know, I'm, I'm 30 something. I've got a family. I, I, I don't have time for church right now. I've, I've got to spend time with my kids and, and my wife because they're going to be grown up and gone out of the house. And, and I've got two mortgages that I've got to pay for and a, a new car that's sitting in the driveway. And uh, the, the bills and everything else. I've got to work and I've got to do things. I don't have time for church. I don't have time for God right now. Once the kids get grown out of the house and I get my mortgage caught up and things go okay, uh, when I got time, then I'll, then I'll spend time with God. And you don't know when your time's up. You know, uh, again, I, I say that I worked at a funeral home for a couple of years and, and death does not come just to the old and, 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 and feebled. Uh, death comes for everybody at any time, unexpectedly, and in sometimes some of the strangest ways uh, imaginable. If you don't have your relationship with Jesus Christ right, you need to get it right today. Because you may not be here tomorrow. Question four, and this ties in with this, it says, what are some ways... We can stay on guard about false teachings. Now, this is a uh, Second Thessalonians, um, the passage that Paul talks about. 
So we have to understand the culture of the time, the technology level of the time uh, in this particular instance. So let's start off. Books. Books, volumes, codexes, uh, scrolls, whatever at th this particular time was written were expensive. I'm talking they were the they were the cost of having uh, some type uh, of written document in this this particular time outside of uh, just short letters or whatever were only affordable or only accountable for the very, very, very wealthy, meaning kings and, and uh, the like of that, or organizations that had resources to enormous amounts of money. And in this case, it would have been churches or libraries or those those kind of things. So it wasn't like when the, the Gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, or John uh, were written to be able to go to a church if you wanted a physical copy of it. It wasn't like they could run down to Kinko's and just run off a couple of copies and, and be done with it. They had to hire somebody to hand copy uh, the text. And it wasn't just you, you pulled some schmo off the street and say, here, copy this. These were people who had studied their entire lives on how to copy things and make sure uh, that things were, were copied correctly. And they weren't cheap. They didn't come cheap. Scribes were very well paid for the work that they did. Uh, because if, you, if you're paying somebody to make a copy for you, you want it to be right. Right. I mean, that stands to reason. You don't want them to paraphrase uh, what they think about the, the text. You don't want them to skip words or misspell words or anything like that. You want it to be as exact, as exact as it possibly can. And so they pay these guys a lot of time. And so when you have books, uh, and we're going to use the Gospels as that. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were circulated to all these churches at this time. And they were coveted and they were very, very expensive. And people were paying, uh, churches were paying an enormous amount of money uh, to have these documents in, in their own personal possession that they could refer to, not just borrow from somebody for a couple of weeks and then have to give it back. And, and so there were entrepreneurs uh, available at that time too that realized, man, uh, these guys are making tons of money in these books. If I write a book and I put one of these apostles' names on it, uh, I can write whatever I want as long as it sounds churchy or, or sounds kind of godly, godly or Jesus-y. Uh, and, and it catches on just a little bit. I'll be rich. And so that's what happened. You had people that started imitating uh, the apostles, that started imitating Paul uh, and sending out letters and documents on uh, how people needed to act and how people needed to connect with God. And a lot of times it's a lot like what happens today with the internet. Uh, you can find a religion that will coincide with your current lifestyle very easily. And you can be a, you could be a follower of that religion and never have to change your lifestyle. Uh, and, and that's not really, that's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is transforming us to be more like Jesus. And, and so that we have to make changes. We have to, uh, uh, we're at constant odds with our own lifestyle uh, in that way that we are, are being changed and at war uh, with the world to be more spiritual and be more like Christ. So Paul warns the, the church here at Thessalonian to be careful on the letters that they receive because he knows that there's somebody out there pretending to be him that are sending letters to these churches that are telling them to do things that are not true. Uh, it could be somebody that, like I said, it could be somebody that just wanted to wanted to cash in on the uh, the wave uh, of Christianity and get rich. It could also be some other. Uh, it, it could have been a government of, uh, official or vo or office uh, that was writing that to tell people, hey, you need to give your you need to give your uh, not only do you need to give tithes to God, but you need to give tithes to your, to your city or tithes to your thing or 
You need to uh, do certain things that would benefit whatever government was done in that. And so Paul warns them. He says, hey, you need to be careful on, on the things that you're adopting into your church. And, and that goes for us still today. And the only way we can figure out false teachings is we have to know what the true teachings are to begin with. And we find the true teachings by reading the Bible. Uh, I'm not... I, I, I'm not discounting anybody's pastor that's watching this, but if you are relying on your pastor for your knowledge of the Bible, you are in a very dangerous position. You need to double check everything your pastor says against scripture. Uh, and I say that again, I'm not discounting pastors of any kind in this particular point. But I know pastors are human. And, and I know sometimes they may say something that they uh, that didn't come out of their mouth exactly the way they wanted to or may have uh, or, or may have been interpreted in a certain way that was not intended by by him when he was doing his sermon prep. Uh, but everything that comes out of his mouth, everything that he says, everything that he refers to, to the Bible, you should double check. And if it doesn't line up, ask him about it. Uh, and if he gets mad at you for it, uh, that may be a sign you need to look for another church. Um, I, I know during these classes, when I preach, uh, anything else, I welcome criticism and I, and I welcome critiques. I don't always get things right. And, and especially when I'm talking, uh, the way that it it sounds in my head, or the idea that I have in my head, uh, doesn't always uh, translate exactly when it comes out of my mouth. And, and so I, I welcome criticism and, and critiques on my teaching and my preaching both, uh, because I, I want to make sure the, the point that I have is the message that I am putting forward, I want the receiver, the, the listener, the congregation member, to be able to understand it in a way that they can apply it to their lives. And if they're not being able to do that, then we need to have a little, we need to have a longer discussion one-on-one -on -one so I can help bridge the gap so they can understand it. Uh, not for my case, it's not my words, it's not my ideology. And when I have an opinion, I tell everybody, this is my opinion, my personal opinion, and, and, and the way that I have uh, looked at and interpreted scripture in this particular way. Now that doesn't mean that I am absolutely right. And I'm up for somebody to change my mind. If somebody can say, hey, yeah, I think you're wrong about this particular part and this is why. And I, it won't be the first time that I was wrong about something. Uh, but we have to be kind of open to uh, understanding and learning in that way that what we believe may not be uh, the, the correct understanding of, of a particular scripture. But the, but the uh, responsibility a lot of times it falls on us to know the Bible well enough uh, that we can uh, back up what the, what the pastor is saying. I want to read, uh, we're about out of time, I want to read the, this last scripture passage and then we'll We'll close out. This is going to be in Revelation uh, chapter 21. Last book of the Bible. On, next to the last chapter that we've got here. Verses 1 through 8. And this is John, the the uh, the apostle, not the Baptist. Uh, this is this is John, the, the one that Jesus loved, the one that wrote the Gospel of John, uh, the letters of 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Uh, he had a revelation. He had a vision. And this was, uh, the book of Revelation is the vision that he had. Um, there we go. And so it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, 
The dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with him, them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, nor the former thing, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And so this is the promise that God offers us. This is the reward uh, that we're working for. This is the thing that we need to look past uh, the temporary that we talked about earlier in this lesson to look to the permanent. And it's a promise in verse 3 in this that he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither will there be mourning nor crying nor pain and for all the former things will be gone away. So there won't be any pain, there won't be any discomfort, there won't be any doubt, there won't be any sorrow, there won't be any uh, loss, there won't be anything that we deal with on a daily basis here in, in, in this body will be gone. It will be paradise, it will be uh, glorious. Uh, we won't have to go to church anymore because God will be there with us all the time. There, there won't be a temple because a God, a God will be present there. Uh, if you don't like church now, you, you're really not going to like heaven a whole lot because it's going to be like the, the longest church service you have ever been to as it lasts for eternity. And it will be us praising and worshiping him, uh, throughout all eternity. Uh, everything, and he promises everything of this, that we know of, uh, of this world and of this existence will be gone. The, the earth, the, the planet earth that we live on will be gone. The solar system will be gone. The universe will be gone. Uh, everything will be gone and he will create something new for the ones he has chosen and called to his own. And we will live out eternity in the new heaven and the new earth. I hope you've enjoyed this series. I, I, I hope that you're encouraged if you came in uh Whenever you came in, if you missed some of the lessons, that you'll come back with us. Again, uh, we will not meet or I will not be broadcasting next Sunday morning uh, to take some time off to, to do a little bit of extra preparation. Uh, but starting November 1st, we will be back. Uh, we will be starting in the uh, new or the Old Testament. Uh, the first lesson that we're going to do in, in November 1 will be, uh, basically it'll be me. Uh, we're we're going to talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about the book itself. We're going to talk about the, the different languages, uh, the importance of those languages uh, on how they were written, uh, the, the different time periods, the, the relevance of, uh, of how the books are, are divided uh, or how they are grouped together. We're going to talk about how the Bible was put together, uh, what books, uh, what, how long the books have been there, who wrote the books, all those kind of things. So we're going to be talking about the, the actual structural part of the Bible itself on November 1st. And then uh, November 8th, we will actually uh, begin in Genesis 1 and 2 uh, that we go into that. But it, it, the, uh, the lesson on November 1st is, is very important, very insightful. Uh, if you haven't studied, uh, not necessarily scripture of the Bible, but I'm talking about Bible history and that kind of thing uh, is usually a good conversation uh, to have. So uh, I hope all is well. I hope to see some of you in, in church this morning at 1030 Central Standard Time. Again, the address for our church, Community Church at Cedar Springs, is 8825 Brownsville Road in Brownsville, Kentucky. Uh, we are practicing social distancing protocols, so uh, feel, f feel free uh, to come in and be comfortable. Uh, 
having service with us today. Uh, we do provide masks and, and uh, hand sanitizer if you don't have that. Uh, we also try to distance everybody at least six feet apart while we're in the sanctuary. Uh, join us tonight uh, for our other adult Bible study at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time. Uh, and uh, we will go through that as well. Uh, as we dismiss, if you would, uh, let's pray and, and uh, give you a chance to enjoy this beautiful day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson, Lord. We thank you for the promise that you've given us, Lord, the, the peace and calm that that promise should bring to, to everyone who is a follower of yours. Lord, we, we just ask that your presence be upon us, Lord, to be able to see through the things that are temporary, uh, that are going on around us, Lord, to, to stay focused on you, to stay focused on the promise that you have uh, put, put before us. Lord, I pray for every pastor that is delivering your word today. Uh, I pray that they are, are, are able to uh, be void of any type of distraction or discomfort, any type of doubt in the word that they are delivering. Lord, if they will speak with a boldness that only you can give. Lord, and in the same account, I pray that you prepare the, all the uh, people who will be attending and listening to these messages. Lord, that you will prepare their hearts to receive the message that you have put before them. Lord, that you will uh, cause somebody today, somewhere, uh, to be changed. That their destination from hell uh, will be reversed and that they will seek you out. That they will find you today, Lord. That you will rescue them from uh, the, the true death that, that awaits them in the path that they are following. Lord, we love you, and we praise, and we worship you, and we want more of you in our lives. So we ask that as we go our separate ways, that you, your spirit will be upon us through this week, Lord, that you will watch over us, protect us, and, and uh, guide us along the path that you would uh, have us follow. And Lord, we just pray and ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Uh, have a great day, and hopefully we will see you later. Bye.